I am very excited to introduce this keynote, Shared Voices, Learning from Each Other. We all know how helpful it is to share and hear from each other, which is why year after year, this session is one of our most popular. We are looking at all of your questions, so start sending them. Remember to send your questions via text. I believe the numbers are on the screen. And I'm honored to introduce to you today, to introduce to you today our panelists. Instead of me introducing them, I will allow them to introduce themselves. That's who you really want to hear from. And then we'll kick it off from here. Jonice? OK. Good morning. My name is Jonice Lewis. I am 38 years old. No, 39 years old. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer de novo um, September 2020 um, with ERPR positive, HER2 negative. Thank you, Katie. Hi, I'm Katie. I am 47. I was diagnosed in 2016 de novo, and I am triple positive and on first line treatment. Good morning, my name is Tony Willis and I was diagnosed with uh, triple negative breast cancer in 2013 at the age of 49, uh, stage 3B, and I had a recurrence in 2015 um, and I'm still on my first line of treatment of carboplatin. Good morning, my name is Brittany Beadle. I am currently 27 years old. I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in 2015 at the age of 18. My subtypes were HER2 positive, ER positive, and PR negative. And uh, just recently it flipped and now I'm just estrogen positive and I am on my sixth line of treatment, but it's been nine years, so. <laughs> Thank you so much to our panelists for their generosity and sharing their stories with us today. I will be taking questions throughout, the, uh, throughout our panel discussion, so I'll be working with our LBVC staff member, Stephanie. Um, so as we go throughout our conversation, we will um, get, uh, get questions. Let me start by explaining the format. I will be asking questions on different topics related to diagnosis, mm -hmm. treatment, and coping. And then we'll take questions, th as I shared throughout the program, we'll also be talking about family and children and relationships, and we will close off our session um, talking about living well with metastatic breast cancer. Um, so we're gonna go, we're gonna go directly into uh, diagnosis. Um, I know each of you have um, already shared um, information with us, but we wanna go deeper. Um, and really talk about um, once you um, heard this news, um, how did you initially cope with your diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer? Jonice, I'll start with you and we'll just allow the conversation just to flow. Okay. Um, my initial um, reaction is I was angry. Mm -hmm. um, angry because I had um, a prior history of um, cystic breasts is what I was told. And I had been dealing with that 10 years prior to my diagnosis. Um, the original biopsy came back benign. And for years after, every time I would bring it up to a doctor's attention that I feel a lump, it would always be, they would always refer it back to that previous biopsy, stating that it's the same cystic breast, it's probably benign, and that there was nothing for me to be concerned about. That um, initial biopsy was when I was 25 years old, and um, 10 years later, 35 is when I was finally diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. Um, a week after my diagnosis, I found out that <clears throat> I was pregnant, five weeks pregnant, with our second child. And the anger just hyped up more because I felt like this is a time when I'm starting a family 
and now I'm dealing with a metastatic breast cancer diagnosis that could have possibly been caught earlier. So, Jonice, I know I've, I've had the honor to be able to connect with these ladies um, while we were prepping for this panel um, and um, just talking with you. I, I asked you the question, do you, from what you shared with me, did you feel like you were being dismissed? I definitely felt like I was being dismissed, mm -hmm. um, primarily my age, mm -hmm. because I was always told, oh, you're young, your breasts is changing, hormones, everything under the sun, but breast cancer. I did not have and do not have a family history. So um, that's not something that was of concern to me, um, but it was always my age. I'm young. Yeah, yeah. I'm young. Katie, can you share with us um, how you initially coped with your diagnosis? Yeah, I think for me, a little bit different. I was 40, so it was at my first mammogram. And I, um, I had felt pain in my breast, but through manual exams and even my um, doctor doing manual, we didn't feel anything. So I assumed it was going, that the mammogram was going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't bring anybody with me. And so for me, initially, everything spiraled really fast. When I showed up and they did the mammogram, um, they sent me into a room for uh, an ultrasound, and then she said, well, get ready, we're gonna do a biopsy. And so she wasn't aware that I didn't know what was going on. And then the radiologist came in and said, you have a very angry lump, and I'm not letting you leave without completing a biopsy. So for me, um, unlike Janice, like you were fighting for it, I was just kind of in shock and awe. Um, and when they told me it was stage four de novo, I didn't get any hope initially, and they pretty much, you have three to five years, um, you know, get your stuff in order. And so I took it upon myself to start researching and figuring out that, you know, that wasn't going to be my story. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love to hear that. Tony. Uh, for me, I actually felt um, a lump in my right breast uh, in the shower. I was actually at a conference. <laughs> And um, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I hope this isn't cancer. And uh, being a physician, you know, I got in with, I had a friend examining me at a meeting the next day. She brought me into the office. She did an ultrasound. Um, she immediately uh, referred me to a surgeon. Um, and the surgeon actually did a biopsy right there in the office. Uh, that was on a Thursday. And... Um, she called me uh, to tell me, you know, that I had breast cancer um, and wanted me to come into the office that Monday. Uh, so I was kind of preparing myself for having, you know, the typical lumpectomy and radiation, thinking that I was probably going to be hormone positive. And so when she told me that it was triple negative, I knew um, that that meant I was going to need to have chemotherapy and that changed the whole game uh, because I had a friend who had dealt with triple negative breast cancer five years prior. Um, so it was a big shock um, and I, it's the same thing. You, you go through the shock and awe uh, process. Um, it, there's, it's a very long time you know, before you get to the point where cancer isn't the last thing you think about before you go to sleep and the first thing that wakes you up in the morning, but that gets better. Um, and so I launched into my treatment, had a year of you know, standard of care treatment, um, had a foundation one study, so they added Zalota, three months of Zalota at the end, just kind of trying to throw the kitchen sink at this whole thing, um, you know, keeping in mind that triple negative breast cancer is one of the most aggressive forms. So I went through about one year of treatment um, decided I wanted to go back and do a prophylactic um, left mastectomy um, and initially was going to do a tram flap, but they said that probably wouldn't heal well. So I was preparing for a DIEP flap, waiting for the kids, you know, to get out of school and had everybody lined up to come uh, to, you know, rotate, help the family and help care for me. 
Um, and knowing that breast cancer likes to go to the bones, the liver, uh, the brain, um, and the lungs, uh, during the pre-op, the doctor wasn't going to get a chest x-ray. So I said, well, let's get a chest x-ray. We haven't done that in a while. You know, I knew that we had scanned my liver in preparation for uh, the surgery, and the next day she called me back and said, chest x-ray doesn't look so good. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? So, you know, we got a CT scan the next day. I had multiple nodules in my left lung and several mediastinal nodes had um, been enlarged. Um, so she said, well, you know, can we cancel this, this, the surgery? I said, sure. Um, and we got a PET scan and so that confirmed, you know, that I had had spread to lungs in the mediastinal nodes. So if I hadn't advocated for myself, if I hadn't asked mm -hmm. for that chest x-ray, there's no telling how this story would have ended. I would have undergone major surgery um, with metastatic breast cancer. So um, wow. I'm very happy that I was able to advocate for myself and we got the diagnosis. Thank you, Tony, for sharing. Brittany? When I was diagnosed, I felt I was shocked and confused. Um, in February of 2015, I felt a lump in my breast and my mom made an appointment for me where I had an ultrasound and a mammogram. And the doctor said, you have a mass, but you're 18, and 18-year-olds don't get breast cancer. And she sent me home. So then three months later, I now had an inverted nipple, and the lump had grown immensely. So I told my mom once again, and she made me another appointment. And I had an ultrasound and a mammogram. But I remember seeing the look on her face when she saw that I also had an inverted nipple. It was of worry. So she decided to biopsy it. And then it was the very next day that I was called in. And she sat me down and told me I had breast cancer. And I was just in shock and so confused because three months prior, I was told that I couldn't get breast cancer because I was 18. So that was shocking for me and then I almost feel like I had two different diagnoses because first they told me oh you're young so you must be in early stage so they rushed me in to have a double mastectomy and then a month after that um, I had my first PET scan and that's when I learned that I was actually metastatic and it had spread through to my bones and my liver already and that one was harder for me to cope with because I didn't know much about cancer. So I just associated it with, oh, I, I'm going to die. And um, so I just really leaned on my friends and my family during that time. And um, we got through it. Thank you for sharing. And thank you, mom, wherever you <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I think that's so important, especially at a young age, I have two daughters and I'm always telling them if you feel a change, if you notice anything, like let me know. And so I, when you were sharing um, with every time you said I went to my mom, I went to my mom, that's so important. Um, I want, this is really for, for, the, for the group. Um, how did your healthcare providers prepare you? Um, did they help prepare you uh, for what to expect um, as a person living with metastatic breast cancer uh, physically, emotionally? Yeah. Not really. No. <laughs> yeah, I um, saw so many different doctors when I was first diagnosed because they didn't know what to do with me because I was so young. And I had some doctors give me the worst case scenario and talk to me about dying. And then I also had a really amazing oncologist who told me, you know what? Don't pay attention to the number. That means nothing. Please don't put your energy towards that. And he said, there will be bumps along the road, but I will do my best to be there with you and get you through those bumps. And I feel like that was the best thing he could have done, was give me that hope. And that's kind of what I took with me to help me get through you know, the whole diagnosis. And that's kind of, I guess, the only way that I was prepared. But no one actually told me exactly what living with metastatic which looked like they just gave me worse or best case scenario, and that was it. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, we're gonna kick it to you for any audience questions that have come in. Yes, we've already had several. Um, somebody asked, uh, and I think any of you who are interested in answering this one would be great with it, what helps you most to deal with anxiety, particularly around scans and uh, progression? 
Hmm. Um, for me personally, um, I always plan something to look forward to. And um, that we've kind of, my husband and I, we've kind of set it as a celebration. So I'm not so much looking forward to the scan, but whatever it is that we plan on doing after that scan. So it's just reverting my focus, if that makes sense. Um, my, my oncologist gave me that idea um, because I would often go to her and express how I feel like I'm on a three month life lease. Mm -hmm. And it's like I'm renewing my lease every three months. Mm -hmm. And she was like, no, I don't want you thinking like that. So plan something to look forward to. And it takes your mind off the scan and you're looking forward to that celebration. And that's what we do and it works. Yeah. I think so, on, the, on that yeah. same vein, for me, um, because I have to go get treatment every three weeks. I made that, like I take the whole day off work. Um, my husband always, like I only get like a coffee outside the house every three weeks. So, but he would go pick it up and he'd leave it on the counter with a note. Um, I wrote my kids, I, each of them have a notebook. And so I would sit there with the infusion. I would write them each a letter. Um, and so I just kind of made it me time. So it's not necessarily the skin anxiety, but you're connecting something fun, like the coffee, meaningful for the kids. Um, sometimes afterwards, you know, I might meet a friend for lunch, which I wouldn't have done, or I would go, uh, <laughs> there is a humane society. So sometimes I would go sit in yep. there and like <laughs> hang out with the kitties because it's just right, right there. So, I mean, and that's free. And, and they like you to hang out with their, with their pet, you know, with the animals. So, I don't know, I just try to make it, like, so it's not like wah wah, you know. I get scans um, three or four times a year, and somehow I've been able to kind of compartmentalize my anxiety um, about what is going to be shown on the scan just at the time of the scan. Um, and I traveled to Houston from Dallas, um, so it's a three-day trip, you know, kind of gotten used to the routine. And um, uh, so, you know, my scan, scan anxiety is really just within that three-day period. Um, and then I just try to live my life all of the <laughs> time in between. I do something very similar to where I always plan fun things, um, like going to the beach because I live near the beach, or going to Disney, um, just always trying to find joy. And um, But I also heard one person tell me something that really helped with my mindset when I was experiencing anxiety. And they said they look at scans like, um, so you could look at scans, and of course they're scary, but you could also look at them as like they're gonna tell you your healing path. So, okay, if they're good, then that means you're gonna like continue on and everything's gonna be well. But if they're bad, then you know, you're gonna come up with another plan and it's just gonna set you on the healing path that you need to be on. And so now I always kind of think of my scans as, okay, it's just gonna tell me what path I need to be on next. And that helps me a lot with the anxiety. Yeah. Thank you, um, thank you all for sharing. Um, I want to move to, um, and I think a lot of you have kind of sh have set the table to share this next question. How are you? Co how has your coping style changed, if at all, um, since your initial time of diagnosis? I, I think for me, before I was diagnosed, everything was. A, I'm an occupational therapist by trade, so I take care of people, and so I think. I was always taking care of my kids or my clients or my husband or, you know, and so I think once you're diagnosed, you have to take a step back and realize that you need to save some of that time and take care of yourself. So we've discussed diagnosis um, and after diagnosis comes conversations around treatment and side effects. Um, and as we, as we move through this next sec section, um, our first question is, once you started your first treatment, um, well, first let's back up. 
once you started the conversations with your healthcare providers to discuss your, your treatment pathway, um, how did that initially feel for you? Um, I'll start with uh, Brittany. Um, can you repeat the question one more time? I'm sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, once you started your treatment and once you all started to have conversations mm -hmm. around your treatment, how did that initially feel for you? I'm, I'm sure you were hearing new new terms, new just a lot of different news um, at, um, at coming a lot, all at once. How did, how did that initially feel for you? Yes. Um, in the beginning, it was very overwhelming, of course, because I didn't know much about cancer at all. Um, of course, there was new terms like HER2 positive and ER positive, and I didn't know what that meant. Um, luckily, I had my mother to help navigate all of that with me, so I feel like having um, someone with you to help take in all the information, too, is super helpful because when you're at these appointments, it's just so overwhelming, and your doctor is talking, and you, you don't catch everything, right? So either write it down or, you know, have a caregiver with you there to help, you know, take in that information because it's a lot. Um, but I also kind of felt in a weird way, like ready to start my treatments. So when we began talking about the treatments, I almost felt like, okay, yes, let's start this so I could begin to take my body back. So I kind of felt a ray of an emotion, emotions, confusion, scared, but also, weirdly empowered and ready to start. Tony? Well, when I was first diagnosed, I you know, went to MD Anderson for a second opinion. Everybody kept saying, get to MD Anderson, they'll know what to do. Um, and you know, when the doctor told me that because my cancer was located in two, the way she explained it to me, she said it's, it's in two places. So we're not likely to cure you um, but we do agree with the uh, chemotherapy regimen that your local doctor has recommended. Um, so we are recommending that you go on treatment to try to prolong your life. And so, you know, that was just very, very disappointing for me. Um, it took a while for me, you know, to kind of get, get over that because I was still, my goal was still to be cured. And, um, and there were no goals set for me. So I said, okay, well, if they're not gonna set any goals for me, then I'm gonna set goals. I'm about to be MD Anderson's next miracle. And when I come back in three months, my tumors are gonna be 50% you know, uh, reduced in size. And um, when I came back three, three months later, my tumors were right at 50%. So, um, you know, I had to set the goals, and um, each time I came back, my tumors kept shrinking more and more, um, and um, I actually reached uh, the stage of no evidence of disease after one year of treatment. Um, so, you know, the goal of treatment with metastatic breast cancer is to um, increase your uh, well, your disease, your progression-free um, uh, period, um, but some of us do have the bonus of um, the chemo melting our tumors away to the point where they aren't um, discernible on PET scan. So I stopped asking for a break. I kept asking for a break, and she said, no, this is lifelong. Um, but a year and a half later, she said, well, I'm going to report, I'm going to um, present your case to the tumor board and see if they agree with giving you a break. And so I thought that would take a while. She called me the next day and said, everybody overwhelmingly agreed for you to take a break. So I uh, stopped treatment, came back for scans every three uh, months, and it took about a year for my mediastinal node to light up again. So I've gone through that pattern three times. I've taken two one-year breaks, and then my last break only lasted four months. So we thought, oh, it's gaining on us. Um, but now I'm, I'm back on chemo every three weeks. But we do um, schedule around, you know, life events. If a trip is coming up, you know, if a birthday is coming up, then we'll either kick the can down the road one extra week, or even during the holidays, they um, allowed me to take a break so that I can enjoy the holidays more so um, 10 years into this this is uncharted territory so we're just kind of you know feeling our way through it thank you tony katie um for me 
initially was because I wanted to get rid of it mm -hmm. and I wanted to do all the things I was young and so initially there was lots of shock because things were taken away from me I was first told some of my uh, initially they thought I was earlier stage and so they said you were gonna do you know taxotere carboplatinum and herceptin and progetta and then when I had the PET scan and I was stage four it was in my liver and spine then they took away the carboplatinum mm -hmm. and I just felt like I was being dismissed it wasn't explained to me that we were saving it for later and that the standard of care is the T, the H, and the P. But to me, it felt like I was, you know, like they didn't want to help me live. And then I wanted breast, my breast removed, and that, that wasn't an opportunity afforded to me. So I never was um, given um, mastectomies or any of, of those type of surgeries. And once again, that felt to me... Um, like I wasn't being cared for. Mm -hmm. And so I really advocated for myself. I did do second opinions. Um, I've asked numerous oncologists now that I'm kind of in the advocacy world about like, okay, anybody want to cut them off? Right. <laughs> but I've learned now that it is okay that they are still with a part of me um, and that I'm no evidence of disease and that um, research is showing that is the way that we can go now that less is actually more. I mean, mm -hmm. less is okay. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean um, that they are not fighting for you to live. That research is showing that there's no, that you do not need to have that surgery. And so I've just learned and empowered myself um, that just because something is taken off the table doesn't mean that they're not fighting for you. Um, and but sometimes you have to find those answers yourself. Mm -hmm. Katie, I have one quick follow-up question and then we'll get to Janice. I know on our call we discussed, uh, you, you live in a rural community. Yes. Um, can you share, um, was, it, was, was that a challenge for you? Um, and if so, could you just share with, you know, I heard you say you got second opinions. Yeah. Um, could you share, was that a challenge? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but I want, wanted to share. For me, like being in a rural in a rural community, I have a general oncologist. So we heard that this weekend, they treat everything. They're not a specialist, and so um, that made me a little bit nervous, especially when they were taking things off the table and not wanting to do things. Um, and so I did travel two hours away, um, which some people have to do even just for a general oncologist. Mm -hmm. Um, to meet with a breast specialist, and they agreed that the plan I was on um, was was what they would have selected for me to do. And so it was very, it was much more convenient to stay in my community and receive treatment. I just know now, as I'm learning more, like if and when I have progression, I would probably go to the breast specialist, but ask the general oncologist at least so I can keep the treatment local. Um, but I've just learned that because they know a little bit of a lot of different things that I have become the expert of my own care. Mm -hmm. And my first oncologist when I went and brought some um, evidence-based research, um, she asked me if I read it on some blog. And I was like, mm, this isn't a good fit because you are um, dismissing me and I'm not an equal partner and this is my life and my health. And so I got a new oncologist because that wasn't fair. Mm -hmm. Jonice, can you share with us how um, you felt um, as your treatment first started? Okay, so I was scared um, because my situation was a little different. I was dealing with pregnancy and a breast cancer diagnosis. Um, the first doctor that I saw, um, which was a breast surgeon, his question was, is this a desired pregnancy? And from that question, my heart dropped, <laughs> the same way you're reacting. My heart dropped because the next thing I was expecting him to say is, well, sorry, we're going to have to terminate this pregnancy. Um, he did ask... I said, yes, it's desired. <laughs> and um, he said, okay, well, you need to go see a breast oncologist ASAP so that they can come up with a treatment plan. And so I scheduled to see an oncologist and um, she was very reassuring. 
Um, she did tell me that um, I had several options and that I would be able to keep my baby. Um, treatment started after the first trimester, after the baby had developed organs and everything. And so um, I also did a whole lot of research online, which um, came back to a little bit of information. Not much, because um, there's a lot of talk about um, postpartum breast cancer, but not while you're pregnant. Yeah. And um, I actually found Terlisa Shepard's story. She's probably still here. I don't know if she's still here. But um, there she is. I found her story, which um, was a bit of hope um, because she was diagnosed while she was pregnant. And um, the more and more I researched, I found some similar stories. And um, I was able to kind of go into treatment with a little more confidence. And um, successfully completed treatment throughout my whole pregnancy. I had treatment nonstop, um, all the way up into 37 weeks. And um, they called that a break before <laughs> labor, <laughs> 37 weeks, and um, delivered a healthy baby boy. And, yes. and um, after that, it was right back <laughs> to treatment. Um, so it, was, it felt like never ending, but because I was able to accomplish that part, I was able to kind of move forward with everything else because I'm like, okay, I have my baby. Mm -hmm. Now I'm ready to, you know, fight this. Mm -hmm. So that's how. How I did got your there. Um, your oncologist and your OB guy, how did they work together for you to for for your care? I'm glad you asked that. That was another challenge. Um, <laughs> I was told that I would have to see a high risk OB mm -hmm. and a regular OB. The regular OB was the one to deliver, but the high risk, um, she did the monitoring. Yes. So before I ended up with my high risk OB, I had seen three other doctors, mm -hmm. and I was dismissed by all three. They told me that I was too high risk. <laughs> Too high risk. I'm like, but you're the high risk doctor. <laughs> so I was too high risk and that they were not willing to take me on. And so um, I felt defeated at that time because I'm like, okay, there's, my oncologist is telling me that this is doable, but these high risk doctors are saying that I'm too high risk. Um, I was able to connect with an organization who studies um, pregnancy, um, w yeah, women who have di are diagnosed with any type of cancer mm -hmm. and pregnant. And um, she was able to kind of coach me through things to say when I'm meeting with these doctors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how I landed with my high risk doctor who accepted to take me and she worked alongside with the organization. Yeah, and um, that kind of worked out where I formed this network that was able to care for me. That's awesome. I do have one follow-up question I'm gonna ask you when we get into relationships and children. Um, so remind, remind me of that. Um, um, Stephanie, do we have any questions from our audience? We do, we have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna pick one of the many that look really interesting. Somebody asked if each of the speakers could share at what point, if you did do this during your diagnosis journey, did you have genetic testing and or tumor testing? That's a great question. Genetic testing was the first thing that was ordered for me um, when the day she told me I had triple negative breast cancer, she um, put in an order for the BRCA testing. Um, so that was done and then, um, my doctor also ordered a foundation one study uh, for my early breast cancer tumor. Um, and uh, we did a foundation one study for the biopsy of the mediastinal lymph node um, at the time of my 
recurrent diagnosis. I um, did do genetic testing and I did not have any mutations. Um, and But I did meet with a genetic counselor and that was where I got the advice that my daughter and my niece should start doing surveillance at half of the age. So I was 40 and I was educated that um, my daughter and niece should start getting mammograms around at the age of 20. Mm -hmm. I also had genetic testing as soon as I was diagnosed, and I also didn't have any, you know, I didn't have BRCA or anything like that, so. Mm -hmm. So I do want to ask, and this is for anyone who uh, would like to answer, um, how have side effects of treatment impacted your life? <laughs> Fatigue, I think. <laughs> I think we all probably have six new definitions of fatigue. You know, there's the fatigue from your medication, um, the, just the new last of fatigue. It puts me in bed for 36 hours. Um, I call it the sunken place. Um, and um, I forgot what the question was. Side effects. Side effects. Oh, side effects. oh, side effects, yes. yes. <laughs> So <laughs> fatigue is the biggest one, though. I think we all need to admit that. But um, and, and really, unfortunately for me, you know, they've always told me what the side effects of my medications would be. And I've always had the least side effects of all medications that I've had. So I think that's what's made this so tolerable for me. Um, but, you know, peripheral neuropathy, uh, from the Taxol and the Carboplatin. Um, I do the old fashioned, you know, ice water soaks. Everybody in the fusion room is staring at me because I'm the only one doing a, you know, ice water manicure and pedicure, but um, it has definitely minimized the peripheral neuropathy that I've had to deal with. Um, so, you know, fatigue, peripheral neuropathy, those are all pretty major <laughs> for what we're dealing with. Fatigue has been, I feel like, my biggest one throughout all my treatments that I had to learn to kind of deal with um, and kind of adapt. Like, I'm a very adventurous person, but sometimes I have to listen to my body and just realize I need a rest day, I need to take a break, or I love hiking. Maybe this day I can't do the hardest hike. Maybe I have to take, you know, the easier hike. So definitely fatigue is definitely the biggest one and just learning to listen to your body um, so that you could go about your normal life still while handling side effects? I think for me, um, and that's what I'm dealing with most now, is I do have the fatigue, peripheral neuropathy. Um, though I wasn't afforded the opportunity for breast surgery, I did, I got lymphedema. So mm -hmm. this is the fun new side effect. I didn't realize that you could get lymphedema without having <clears throat> um, lymph nodes removed. <laughs> Apparently you can. Um, and so, I think um, I've enjoyed listening this weekend because some of our side effects are hidden and sometimes I feel like I'm going crazy when I try to explain to my oncologist the, like, that I can't feel my fingers, I'm losing my balance, I'm exhausted even though I sleep all this time. And I get lots of like, but your scans are NED, so like suck it up. And like I've really had to advocate for them to hear because I want to go do the things and not be in bed. Um, but I was getting to a point where I felt like I wasn't being heard and that maybe I was kind of you know, crazy. And then I, hearing the different speakers this weekend, it kind of reaffirmed to me that I am not crazy <laughs> and that even though you can't see it, it's going on inside my body and that I need to continue to fight to find resources to help with the side effects. And let's not forget chemo brain. I just showed you the prime example of chemo brain because I couldn't remember the question while I was answering it. So it's real. I can relate to all um, the side effects that they mentioned, but I'm going to take it a little step further. Um, when I was diagnosed, I was two, three years into my marriage, um, starting a family, and um, we were on our second child, and we have two boys. So of course, um, 
our thought was to try again for a girl, but um, that was kind of taken away from me after a diagnosis, and um, that was no longer an option to have children. So um, I recently had a total hysterectomy, and now I'm dealing with those side effects. Mm -hmm. The early menopause, because I'm forced into menopause at the age of 39. Full blown, night sweats, hot flashes, you name it, all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, now even the lack of sexual desire, um, having to deal with that in a marriage can be challenging. Mm -hmm. um, the dryness. Mm -hmm. um, so just trying to find ways to cope with those changes as well, because I think those are um, long-term side effects that we don't talk about much, mm -hmm. um, especially when you're in a relationship yes. and have mm -hmm. to deal with that, or considering going into a relationship mm -hmm. for those who aren't married. And Jonice, you, uh, as you're talking about relationships, um, as we go into this, this next section, it's actually um, one, myself as the receiver of information, but in a different way. Um, when I was 17, I overheard the news that my mother was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. Um, the doctor, the ER doctor told my dad in a very two second short, way um, with no regards of that I was just around the corner and I was hearing this information so it really robbed my mother and my father from sharing that information with me in a way that they wanted to that was taken away from them and so um, as we go into this next section can you share how you shared this information with your children um, with your loved one, with loved ones, with your family members, um, and what that was like. I had to do that twice. So um, my kids were middle school age. I have twins um, when I was first diagnosed. And when you're diagnosed with cancer, the, the most important thing is how are you going to tell your kids? That, that becomes more important than anything else because the last thing you want to do is rock their world and frighten them. So um, it, it took several weeks for me to get uh, my work up completed and to get my port in and we kept, you know, discussing when would be the right time. Um, you know, one afternoon I picked the kids up from school and they said, Mommy, we just heard that, you know, one of our teachers from our old school died of cancer and I thought, oh, Gosh, okay, so uh, this is all we needed. Um, but anyway, uh, they went to um, Six Flags with their class one day, and I went to the surgical center to get my port put in. And so my sister-in-law had come uh, to visit us um, to help out. And it was Mother's Day weekend, and I decided I was starting treatment the next week, so we sat them down. And um, I told them, you know, that I had breast cancer, uh, but that I, I was going to start treatment. And Auntie Al had breast cancer several years ago, and look how well she's doing. And, you know, here are the ways that you can help, because Mommy's not going to always be able to cook and do all the things, and so you can help. Um, so being able to engage the kids and let them know how they can help um, kind of helps them to feel uh, useful um, and um, but I feel like I, I waited too late because they could tell that when I came home from work I'd go straight back to my room so they knew something was wrong so know that kids are gonna know they're, they're gonna sense changes and so we probably waited a little bit too late because they felt like everything was okay and then I just dropped that bomb on them and my daughter's first reaction was am I going to get it? She started crying and wanted to know if she was going to get it. Um, so, you know, it elicits fears in them about whether they're going to, you know, get cancer too. So with my recurrence, we already were preparing for surgery, um, and we really wanted to avoid telling them that it was stage four. And I think there was just an opportunity where I was able to say, well, you know, mom's not going to have surgery. My cancer came back, so I'm going to start treatment again. 
um, and then they knew that you know we were just going to undergo treatment. It wasn't until recently that they really realized that it was stage four, unfortunately. Um, and um, they both are in healthcare. They both are um, in uh, school to be nurses. So as their medical knowledge, you know, evolved, then I would kind of, you know, give them a little bit more information about what was going on. I think for me, um, I had a fifth, fourth grader, sixth grade around there. Um, <laughs> We sat them down for breakfast, and uh, maybe we don't sit at the table and eat breakfast together very often. And uh, then any time after that, any time I would make breakfast, they thought they were going to hear bad news. <laughs> um, so maybe don't wrap it around like an no. event. Because <laughs> now I had to tell them, I promise I will never give you bad news over breakfast ever again. <laughs> Um, but we were very honest and truthful from the beginning. I didn't hide anything. I just said that I had cancer um, and that we were going to do everything that needed to be done. I was very mindful of trying to keep their life as normal as possible um, and so that it didn't challenge them or that they could just keep living their lives. And at that age, we talked about it sleeping. And I was just like, you know, cancer right now is sleeping. I will let you know when to worry. And even though my daughter is 16, 17, <laughs> um, she will ask me, when are your scans? Is it still sleeping? Like, you know, we kind of keep that. I think um, for me, with having children that age, when I found out I was stage four, I actually withdrew. So I kind of um, started being a watcher of my life. Um, because I was worried that I was going to leave and I had to make sure my husband could do all the things. And so I really did not want to engage. And so it took a little while um, to kind of realize that that wasn't the way to do it and I needed to create memories and be a part of their life. Even if I ended up leaving early, you know, that they needed that. But initially, I kind of wanted to you know, watch and make sure that my husband could do all the things, you know. Our boys are still too young. Mm -hmm. um, next month, they'll be three and five. Mm -hmm. And um, although they've watched the physical changes, um, there's nothing that I could possibly tell them that they would comprehend right now. Um, they just know that oftentimes mommy is not feeling well. Um, they've seen me go in and out of surgery. They know when mommy has the pink pillow <laughs> on her chest, she is not feeling well to step away. And so we've kind of just had that, you know, going. Um, my oldest, he um, is special needs. He's on a spectrum. And um, he would oftentimes... Um, just make comments about my hair when I lost my hair um, because I would wear wigs. And so if I'm caught going out the house, going to the mailbox, mommy, don't forget your hat. <laughs> so he will remind me quick, like, don't forget your hat because he's very OCD. Like he wants things done the same way. Like, no, you have to do it this way. So get your hat, then you go outside. So, um, that's, that's the way they look at it. And one day I'll figure out how I'm going to, well, if I'm here, um, figure out how, well, I am going to be here. Yes. Um, yeah, yes. I am going to be here. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will be here. So um, I will be here to tell them when they're older and can comprehend all of that. So um, yeah, my little one, he, he doesn't even know what breasts look like, you know, until I had reconstruction. He thinks it's my stomach that grew. So, <laughs> so yeah, it, I have time, I guess, to kind of process how, and from others sharing their stories on how to share, I kind of pick up from that and take notes. Yeah. Yeah, I won't do it at breakfast. <laughs> and you will be here. And I will be you here. You will be here. Brittany, you are a newlywed. <laughs> yeah. We eloped in Vegas randomly on accidentally a leap day. So it was February 29th. So we'll have four years until our next anniversary. 
<laughs> um, but we decided to do it because we still have to live our lives and you know we love each other and um, <laughs> even though there's a lot of uncertainty about futures with metastatic breast cancer we always dream of growing old together and being little old people and um, yeah so we got married <laughs> I, and I know we had our discussions. Um, now that you and your husband are married, are there conversations that you all are having around family planning? And would you feel open to sharing more with us? Yes, we are talking about that now a lot because we both do want children. Um, but of course, I want to make sure that I'm at least two years with you know stable scans because I just recently had 2023 was a crazy year for me. So I do want to be at least um, two years stable, but we are planning. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I did ask about fertility, um, but I was never taken seriously. I was actually told, oh, but you have at most three years to live. Who would take care of your children when you're gone? And um, I was so young that I didn't know to speak up and keep pushing for more answers. So unfortunately, I, I didn't do anything for fertility. So um, we're, talk we're having conversations around surrogacy and there's egg donations. So it wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't have a biological child, but I know I would love that child no matter what. And even if we don't go that route and there's adoption. So we have had um, discussions around all of this and uh, it's definitely a hard topic to talk about sometimes because I definitely get emotional when I talk about it with him because it was always my dream to have children, and like, I think it's so beautiful to have um, like a little, like someone that you created with the person you love. And so cancer did take that away from me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I know that if I have children, no matter how we have children, I will love that child. Brittany. Sorry. <laughs> no, you do not have to this apologize. It's really an emotional topic to talk about. <laughs> there is nothing to apologize for. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, you know, as we as we are having our conversation, I'm hearing just the love for your family and friends. And um, I want, wanted you all to share, and I haven't forgotten about the question I want to ask you. Uh, <laughs> What tips would you share, or what tips would you have um, for the closest in your, I'm sorry, what tips would you have for those closest in your life, your spouse, your partners, family members, friends? Oh, tissue, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. What tips would you have for those closest in your life, your spouse, your partners, family members, friends who are looking to lend support or provide you with care? Um, Brittany, I'm gonna kick it back to you. Um, I know you were diagnosed, you said, you shared when you were 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know that was another, um, that was also in itself a, a transition um, from high school, getting ready to start the next chapter in your life. Um, what was that like um, in sharing that, that news with not only your family, but your friends? And um, would you share more? Yeah, so um, I didn't know how to share that news. So I was very fortunate that when um, I was um, told that I was metastatic, I had my whole crew with me. So I had my mom, my dad, my grandfather, and my boyfriend at the time. So luckily, I didn't have to have that conversation separately. The doctor got to have that conversation when we all got to talk about it. Um, and then, oops, sorry. <laughs> and then um, my mom handled telling the rest of my family for me. And with my friends, um, not gonna lie, they found out on Facebook. <laughs> they did find out on Facebook. Um, and then, cause I didn't know how to have those conversations. So then they were texting me and then I did have a full conversation with them when they would come to me. Um, so we did talk about that and um, I felt like, I don't know, I was really lucky to where my, my friends and my family just kind of, they were all there for me. And 
kind of just knew what I needed. Like, I really liked being treated normally. So with my friends, like, it wasn't always conversations about cancer. It was sometimes we would go for a night drive and we would put the music on really loud and I'd stick my head out the sunroof and that was, that was good for me and that's what I needed from them. Um, and even with my husband now, somehow, like, he always asks me, okay, do you want to feel your emotions or do you want a pep talk right now? Because <laughs> he knows that sometimes I just need to feel my emotions, and if he tries to give me a pep talk when I'm sad, it's not going to go well. <laughs> and sometimes I need that pep talk so he could kind of drag me out of that dark space that I'm in. So, um, yeah, so that could be a really good question, I feel like. Like, I just ask them what they need. Do you need a pep talk? Do you need to cry it out? Just... You know, just be there for that, your person. Yeah. I like that. I've heard something similar from another person. Are you, you know, when they're talking, are you talking to, are you talking for me to respond? Are you talking for me to listen? Are you talking for me to help you find a solution? And I think that that really sets the expectation of when you're coming to someone, what you're needing from them. And, and they know what you're needing, you know, and what they can give back. So I, I love that question. Tony, Katie, Janice. I think what came into my head when you were talking about that, like asking for what, what you need is so important. Um, and it re reminds me back to your when you were talking about um, sexual intimacy. I feel like a lot of the times as women, um, we take the burden of our, you know, do, being put into menopause. I had my ovaries removed. Um, and that we take the burden of it's our job to make it a better experience. And so I think it's that opportunity to tell your husband, your partner, um, how that they could also support you and that it's a mutual you know, activity and that they can be, um, intimacy is not always just skin and that there's so much more to it. Um, and so I, f I just wanted like, we don't talk about that a lot. It always feels taboo but I feel like we always put everything on ourselves. And that, um, and so I think that goes with our friends and family, not just in, um, for sexual health, but just like having the conversations, like how they can help us, what do we need? And sometimes we're exhausted and have fatigue and we can't ask what we need. Um, but I've heard kind of like when they were talking yesterday with tools, when you were having those mental um, conversations so you kind of have the rote things to say. Sometimes if you think about the things that you do need, if someone asks, you have your list and you could hand it out and, or say a few things off of it, you know? Um, that way you're prepared. Because sometimes I'm like, I don't know what I need. And then like three minutes later, uh, you're like, shoot, I did, I knew it, you know? So kind of that preparedness of like, okay, if someone asks me, I got two or three things that would be really helpful. And then I'm going to come to Jonice because I have a qu uh, the question I was going to ask you, and then it carries over into one of our questions uh, from our audience. So I'm going to go to Tony. Yeah, I mean, I think we just need to realize that cancer affects the whole family. You know, when one person in the family has cancer, then it affects everyone. And so it's important, you know, to have conversations uh, with your, your family. I think... Um, you know, the pandemic gave us an opportunity to spend more time with our families. And so, you know, having a metastatic breast cancer diagnosis, I made sure that, you know, having my adult kids, I took that time to say all the things that I wanted to say. I'm more intentional with gifts that I give. I give them jewelry that will be reminders. So it, it, um, it's just important to spend as much time and to create memories you know, to just create experiences and memories for the time that we're here. I know, um, Brittany, you said something. Uh, you said, you know, you just wanted to be treated normal. And I know my mom would share that all the time because I felt like I had to be perfect. I didn't want to upset her. And I remember her telling me, stop tiptoeing around me. Like, just come to me with things like, you know, if something happened, I was like, oh, I can't, I can't take that to mom, you know? And she said, Ashley, treat me normal. I'm, you know, treat me like, a, you know, a person. Stop treating me like this. And it was hard to hear because I just wanted to not, you know, bring any more pain or anything to her. So I just had this state of, okay, let me be perfect. Let things be perfect. And I'm so glad she took that pressure off me. And she said those exact words that you just said. And it helped me to realize, like, 
my mom's still normal. Like, she wants to talk to me about things. She wants to know how school is going. And so when you said that, I remember several conversations because I thought I was trying to protect her. Um, but she, that's not what she wanted. She wanted life to continue and conversations to continue. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Jonice, I was going to ask you, um, going back to the relationship with your oncologists and your OBGYNs, um, did you feel that you were in the driver's seat with um, talking with both of you, both of those two different providers of care? Did, did you ever feel like, uh, well, first let me ask, I know with your oncologist, you know, you were the priority, and I know the baby was too, and of course, with your OBGYN, the baby's, you know, still the same priority. Did you feel like you were in the driver's seat or, or did you ever feel um, that one recommendation was prioritized over another? I know for you, your baby was your priority and you were too as well. Um, so that's, that's the question. And also a question from the audience was how are, the, how are babies during and after pregnancy being treated? Um, I felt like I was in the driver's seat the entire time. Um, mainly because there was a lack of experience from some of the doctors on my team. Um, so they were kind of going with the flow, doing the constant monitoring just to make sure that everything was okay. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, what's the second question? The, the monitoring yes. of my child. Yes. There's no monitoring. Um, and as a matter of fact, my husband recently questioned um, a doctor about that. Like, would our son have any testing done, you know, as he gets older since he, you know, was there with me throughout treatment? Um, we were told no only because the chemo did not cross the placenta. Mm -hmm. And so that barrier was always there. So they don't feel like he's at risk for anything. So um, there's no monitoring for him. And as I stated before, he's a completely healthy boy. Yeah, he's the king of the house. <laughs> like He runs <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah. Stephanie, do we have any questions? Somebody asked, in addition to your standard of care treatments, have there been things like faith, exercise, diet, supplements, nature bathing, anything else meaningful to you that you do to cope and live well? Um, I, I started making some changes to my diet when I was diagnosed with um, the recurrence. Um, there's still, well, back then there was still the debate about whether sugar was good <laughs> or not when you have cancer, um, and it, it isn't. And so I've, I've tried to eliminate refined sugar as much as possible um, from my diet. I use um, stevia. Um, I started drinking um, alkaline water, which was a recommendation from a physician friend of mine. Um, I've used flaxseed oil. Um, so I've, I've tried you know, turmeric, all the different supplements. I just decided that I wasn't gonna make my body a welcome host to this cancer. So whatever the cancer's enemy is, is my new best friend. And so that was sort of the attitude that I took. Um, and I'd like to think that those things have helped um, in addition to my you know, standard of care treatment, that those things have helped me uh, to um, fight off this cancer and to keep it from coming back. Um, I wish someone had told me to exercise more, to move more during my early diagnosis because I had just lost weight um, when I was diagnosed with my early breast cancer. I was at my ideal weight, looked the best I had looked in a long time. And you know, I have gained on average 10 pounds per year over the past 10 years. So. Um, I'm trying to move as much as I can whenever I feel good enough to move and I can walk you know, two and a half miles um, at a time, which is great, um, but I wish I had started earlier. 
um, and, and just doing all the self-care. I rest, I listen to my body. When it's time to rest, then you rest um, because uh, your body will tell you, look, you know, if, if, you, if you don't sit down or if you don't lay down, then you're gonna end up on the ground. So you have to really learn how to listen to your body. Um, but, but definitely taking care of your entire self, you know, the mental and the physical is very, very important. I also um, make sure I have like a healthy, balanced diet. Of course, I have little treats sometimes with sweets, um, but for the most part, I really enjoy a healthy, balanced diet. And exercise is huge for me as well. And I think the biggest thing for me is meditation and mindfulness. I feel like it really helps calm my nervous system. So it helps calm like any stress because we all know like stress is really bad on the body. So meditation has been a huge game changer for me. And I know you mentioned nature bathing. <laughs> I also do really love to just put my feet in the grass and just like ground every single day. Um, there's actually a lot of benefits that come along with that as well that um, is good for your immune system and such. So I kind of did all of the above of everything you mentioned. So, <laughs> um, For me, faith is what fuels my journey, uh, my faith. And so I've become more in tuned spiritually and intentional um, with my walk with God. Um, I'm not where I want to be nutritionally yet, but everything with moderation. That's what I keep telling myself. But definitely um, faith, um, just finding that support system, local church. Um, my mother is very religious and um, she brings in her prayer group. I remember when I was first diagnosed, her and her prayer partner slept at our house on the floor on sackcloth in our living room for 24 hours. They fasted and prayed nonstop. And um, after that sacrifice that I watched while I was you know, in and out, sleep, check on them and go back to sleep. But um, after watching that, I knew that I had to do my part. And um, you know, we oftentimes rely on our grandmothers and mothers' prayers, but I was like, okay, now I need to activate my own faith because this is my situation, and um, you know, be better in my walk with God. Mm -hmm. That reminds. <laughs> that reminds me. My dad wrote all the healing scriptures in the Bible on a T-shirt for my mom, and she slept in it every night. And so when you shared that, 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 took, me to, that took me to that memory. Katie? I would say yes to everything that has been said and in the question, but it's always progress over perfection. And I just don't get hung up in all the little details. I still will have a drink. I will still eat the things. I might not take the walk. Um, you know, I have tried acupuncture, different things, but I feel like mental health is really important. We've heard that a lot this week. And if you get stuck in that, I have to drink the alkaline water. I cannot eat the sugar. I got da, 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 da. that creates anxiety in and of itself, which is not healthy either. And so, I still live my life, and and it's just it's a, it's progress, not perfection. We just keep, you know. Well, and that brings us into our final couple of questions. And I think we've already touched on living well with metastatic breast cancer. Um, and so I want to ask, um, I think you've all really covered a lot of these questions. So I'll, um, I'll go to what was the closing question, but um, I'll bring it up to where we are now. When you think about your future, um, what word would you use to imagine and describe it? I'll give you a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. And whoever's ready, yeah, just... Yeah, for me, it's hopeful. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue to be hopeful. I think mine's joy. Mm -hmm. I choose joy. Um, you know, it's choice. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what I do. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, my word is thrive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just it's beyond surviving. Mm -hmm. yeah, just thrive like the best that I can. Mm -hmm. Like just looking forward to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess adventure, because I don't know what my future holds, and it's just one big adventure. So. Um, so my last question, and this is for all of you, um, to your, I know we, you all have multiple caregivers, but to your caregivers, what would you say, what would you share? Um, any, any words? Any just, words to, the, to are those that are supporting and caregivers in the audience? I just want to say we are truly so grateful for our caregivers. Like I'm just so grateful for everyone who's there for me and supports me, and I definitely wouldn't be here without mine. So. Yeah, and I appreciate my husband going to every appointment. Um, you know, uh, he's always been by my side, except in the pandemic he wasn't allowed to, but. Um, he has been there every step of the way, and my kids have been very supportive. And I appreciate, I have Team Tony out there who um, I text every time I come back from MD Anderson to share my news. And I also have girlfriends from college that have, we've taken several girls trips just because um, they want to spend time with me and they know that those experiences are important. And um, I really appreciate those. <laughs> those have helped me. And I think hearing this, my circle's pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I'm in the sandwich generation of having to care for aging parents. Mm -hmm. And so I think if it, this story doesn't resonate with you, as long as you have one person mm -hmm. um, that you can count on and one friend, that that is enough. Yes. And that it's just wonderful that you have that person that you can rely on. Um, caregivers, um, when I think of caregivers, um, you all are the MVPs. Um, for real, because without caregivers, um, we, we just, half of the things we do, we couldn't do it. Um, so caregivers are truly the MVPs. I think about my husband who holds it down with two wild boys when I cannot. <laughs> and um, even my in-laws, they moved to the country last year and they've stepped in and they take control of that house like they've been there forever. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I truly think that caregivers are the real, real MVPs of this journey. And um, if you have that one mm -hmm. caregiver, two, three, small, big, whatever it is, um, you just be grateful for the help that you are getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for uh, taking the time with us this morning, taking the, uh, just bringing us into your experience, um, sharing your family and your loved ones with us and those that love you and those that you love.